Okay, so this session is focusing on the supply chain challenges and how to cope with the cost of living crisis and the impact that's going to have on people's spending power and um, ticket prices, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'll let, again, the um, panel introduce themselves in terms of, um, you know, providing a little bit of background, but if we will if we'll start with um, Yaz, um, if you can obviously... Um, you work on producing festivals and events up and down the country, but can you just give us a little bit of background in terms of, uh, of, of the events you work with and, and the work you do? Yeah, uh, no problem. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Yaz. Um, I'm a director at festival production agency, The Fair, um, and we work with promoters who act as our clients uh, to produce their festivals, so carry out procurement, uh, and we work on independent festivals, so from 5,000 to 20,000 cap, Examples include El Dorado, Gala, uh, Eastern Electrics, Summer Social Rugby Festival. Lovely. And, um, and Will, if you can just talk through your work at Method Events, please. Sure. So, very similar role to Rat Yaz. Um, I'm a director at Method, which is also a festival production company. And we run shows including Tramlines in Sheffield, uh, Truck Festival in South Oxfordshire, and uh, South Facing in Crystal Palace. So um, thank you very much indeed, Laura Armstrong, for t taking the place at the last minute. Obviously, at LS Events, you're involved in some uh, major events in terms, including BST High Park. You were involved in a very, uh, well, a, a huge um, government um, commissioned event, obviously, um, last year. Can you just give us a little bit of background in terms of, um, of the company and your role, please? Um, yeah, I'm senior project manager, so I am the lead person on British Summertime in Hyde Park. But we also do um, festivals such as All Points East, um, and we also do sporting events. So we work with Formula E um, as their London production partner. Um, and then, yeah, as you said, we also worked on Operation London Bridge as the central event management company with the GLA last year. Great stuff. And Stefan, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, cool. So. Um, I run Zenfest, which is a house music festival based in Essex. Um, it started as a pool party probably five, six years ago, so there's 100 people in a back garden, and then we sort of growing it from there. And then I also run Arvo Agency, which is a digital marketing agency, again, based in Essex, and we sort of do all different kinds of stuff. Great stuff. Okay. So um, I wanted to start with, um, with you, Laura, really. If you can talk me through um, how you're seeing the supply chain situation this year compared to last. Obviously, um, everyone was coming out of the pandemic last year, and um, it's been sort of talked at length really about how, um, you know, costs were rising, and, um, you know, you had a backdrop where a lot of equipment was caught up um, in other areas like construction, and also a huge number of um, events taking place. You had major operators launching new events, you had newcomers coming to the market, incredibly congested, uh, at least busy market. Um, how difficult, I suppose, how challenging was last year and how optimistic or otherwise are you about the year ahead? I think last year was, was very challenging. Um, on specific um, suppliers, um, where there, there was a competition across lots of different events and the calendar year makes it challenging. So All Points East is on a bank holiday weekend. That always has more challenges. Um, last year for BST, we moved um, to a three weekend show model, which meant that we were going against Glastonbury um, on our first weekend, which proves challenges. And I think we are likely to see the same issues this year. Um, the procurement cycle feels like it's got longer. So it feels like we are having to get deals and source kit further out than we have done previously. And I think that's something that we shared. Um, we had a conversation about it in the green room, and I think that's something that we all share. Um, but interestingly, I think we're seeing um, less, sorry, more problem with certain suppliers than some of the other shows that Yaz and Will have looked at. OK, obviously, if the procurement cycle's getting longer, it's, or you're starting earlier on, um, with costs sort of rising or inflation stuck at you know, 10, 12, 13%, um, over the last year or so. Um, does that not make it quite difficult to budget or, or how are suppliers kind of reacting to that situation where you're going in and tr trying to strike a deal so much further advanced than you did before when, 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 the, when the economic background was, was kind of much calmer, if you like, the inflation wasn't at that, you know, that uh, the height it is at the moment. So, yeah, so the question is really how difficult it is. You know, I'm, I'm sure. presuming that, that suppliers <laughs> are, are maybe slightly less, to commit, less, less willing to commit so early on. 
Yeah, hoping there's no clients in the room t before <laughs> opening up the budgets. Um, I think it's, it's, you know, you don't want to be teaching your clients to suck eggs, but it's important to remember that inflation is just an index. And yes, yeah, some you might expect the bulk of your costs or your overall budget might be up 12, 13% year on year, but there might be budget lines that are going to hit 20%, especially um, where there's really finite supply of kit. I know a discussion that we all had before this uh, was about large stage structures. There's a really finite number of roofs in the UK now, um, and the, it's a difficult balancing act because if if we're not playing the supplies enough, they're not going to be, in, be able to reinvest new kit and ease up that supply and better provide for our ecosystem going forward. Um, but clearly, if we're paying too much, then, then the events start to not become viable anymore. OK, yes. Are, would you say, suppliers being reasonable and understanding of the wider market? And there's been some conversations about profiteering from some cor in, in some corners of the supply chain. What's your experience been like in that regard? Um, so for us, I think last year, so this time last year when we were procuring for 2022 season, it was a huge shock, the level of increase in price across almost all suppliers. Um, and uh, I also found that last summer, it was a supplier's market. So people who we worked with for many years, we had pencils with, were taking other bookings and not telling us. And you know, they would normally always come to us and say, someone else has, wants your date, you put your deposit down now. They weren't telling us that. And it felt very much like a supplier's market um, and that you know, we were kind of beholden to them and the rules had flipped a bit. Um, this year, I feel like we've settled down a bit, like our clients and us are aware of the cost increases to expect um, and suppliers are being a little bit more transparent, conversations are a bit more open between us and them about what we can realistically afford. Um, so it feels like the playing field with regards to procurement has reset a little compared to last year. Um, but each supplier is, is very different. Some are working in a construction background. They've got more power. They don't need to work on independent festivals that happen once a year. Um, so there is still a bit of a power balance depending on what you're booking. Okay. And, and Stefan, obviously you're an independent festival. How, uh, how difficult, I guess, was, was last year? Were there, were there any impacts on you know, the, the, the supply chain um, situation? Um, yeah. It, but with us, it's, it's, we we don't really have the weight that obviously the bigger ones do. So when we're trying to get quotes and costs, like it is kind of, we kind of just have to take what we can. Like our fencing, for example, he just doubled the, the, the price in from the year before. And I was like, mate, like you've doubled the price. Like how comes he went, yeah, well my costs are double. So the costs are just double and we couldn't get it from anyone else. And it was just like, all right. So you just have to go with it. Like it, that, that's, I feel like with us, we do just have to sort of, go with what we can, do you know what I mean? And like, even some of the relationships that we've used the same guy for toilets year on year, we went back to him and he was just like, yeah, yeah, all good. And then about two months later, it's like, nah, sorry, can't do it now. And like, we don't have the weight to be like, all right, we'll never use you again, because he'll just be like, all right, it'll just go somewhere else. So we just, it just is what it is for us, if you know what I mean. Okay, Will, I mean, do you, are our supplies being um, transparent enough in terms of, because obviously, you know, as you say, they need to invest in their business and invest in their offering, and, and you will then benefit from that investment later on further down the line. But the question really is whether you feel that all suppliers are being transparent enough in terms of you know, the aspects of the, the quotes, in terms of, you know, uh, you know certain bits you'd probably expect to, to go up, but uh, are you getting enough information to, to reassure you that that, that quote is, is robust and, and fair? So I guess the answer is yes, because the suppliers we're going to continue working with are being transparent. Um, and those that aren't, you know, they're, they're budget lines that we don't really have an option but to go out to tender to, to demonstrate that we're delivering value for our clients. We need to be testing the market rather than just accepting, you know, continual bloating of these quotes year on year. Um, but a conversation we had before this um, with the group as well was about, was about the detail on the quotes and I think everyone now needs to be moving towards a framework where they're seeing itemized costs. Um, say, you've got a technical production supplier who might do sound and lights for your top three stages. You need to be asking them for every 
every personnel, all the haulage in there, um, the equipment rental on a per venue basis. Um, and it's really important that people are keeping, keeping hold of that data and using it for, for rebudgeting year on year to ensure that they've got something accurate to benchmark against. It's very easy when you've just got a one line item quote um, to be in a situation where you're not comparing apples with apples year to year. And yes, yeah, what's your perspective on that? Are you, if you, if you, do you, obviously, you know, if you've got trusted suppliers, you're going to go to them again, you're going to go to them earlier, you're going to have a you know, strong relationship. But in general, do you feel that, that, that um, enough is being done to make sure that quotes are transparent and clear? Yeah, I think uh, with some suppliers, uh, they do that automatically, um, and others, they don't. And uh, working in a production agency and from a production background, uh, a lot of our team will know to go back and request those changes, and as Will's kind of intimating, if they're not prepared to break down cost of labor, cost of transport, cost of individual unit kit hire, um, then we can't work with them because there isn't that transparency, so the trust is broken. And it's hard to justify a 30% increase on their item if we can't see where that's gone. Um, you can't just hear, oh, labor costs have increased and so has uh, uh, fuel costs. We, we need to see where that's gone because we have to uh, justify that to our clients as well. Um, so I guess if there's anyone in the audience who doesn't necessarily use a production agency and you're getting costs for things, you just want to really make sure, as, as Will said, that you're getting that broken down so you can analyse it properly. Okay. Um, Laura, I wanted to touch on Operation London Bridge because obviously it's a, it was an enormous uh, undertaking and um, in a year where some events were dealing with difficult situations in terms of not being able to get kit. So how challenging was that? I mean, obviously people were preparing for it well in advance and always knew it was in the background and people might need to jump at a certain point, but how challenging was that bearing in mind the sort of supply chain background um, at that point? I think it was very challenging. Um, as an undertaking, obviously you speak to a lot of different contractors to make them aware um, that this event is going to happen, but you don't know a date, you don't know a time frame. You know, they have prior commitments already to a Glastonbury or to a BST or to any of our shows. So um, we were fortunate, I think it's fair to say, um, in terms of when the event ended up happening. But it's also about that collaboration with contractors that you do have good relationships with and that you do have a kit. Sunbelt were one of those contractors that did invest in a lot of new kit to make sure that they did have availability. Um, and I think because of the scale of the event and the relationship that we had with a lot of those contractors, it was really easy to pull together, not easy, but it was, we were able to pull together based on our relationships that we already have. And also the scale of the event, you know, it was a huge monumental event of its kind and people wanted to be able to say that they were involved in it. And I think that collaboration aspect really showed what the event industry is capable of. And, and just out of interest, I mean, was it kind of, a, you know, obviously it was a very morbid event for a good reason, but I mean, in terms of putting the our, our UK event industry on an international stage and showing what can be done at, you know, short notice, it was, you know, it was amazing. Um, what was the atmosphere like? In, atmosphere? What was the kind of, the, the sort of sense of achievement really afterwards? I mean, was it, were people kind of... I think um, we, you know, we, we got a lot of freelancers and people within a very short amount of time to come work on it. And I think we all felt immensely proud of what we were doing. It was definitely challenging. The landscape was changing daily. We were having lots of last minute, you know, late night calls to make sure that we were able to take the, the information we needed from the GLA and from the, all the different stakeholders that we were working with. But everyone, I think, felt a really big sense of achievement on it. And I think it showed what we can achieve in very challenging circumstances. And I think it's something that anyone that worked on it, organisations and contractors um, alike, that we were very proud of. Yeah, absolutely, for good reason. Um, obviously, you know, the, the impact of the cost of living crisis is obviously seeing people being more cautious with their money. When it comes to ticket prices, ticket sales, you can see events aren't selling out so quickly, whether it's a club event, whether it's an arena event, whether it's a festival. Apart from, you know, clearly things like Glastonbury Green Man, there are certain exceptions to that. But um, what I, I'm just interested to hear what the impact is on ticket pricing and also on how you're coping with that slight sense of insecurity, if you like, where ticket sales aren't jumping out or ticket sales aren't, 
aren't happening so quickly as they were in, in previous years. So, Stefan, for you as an independent operator, how scary is it? Is it? I mean, how? What, what's what's the climate like for you? What's the um, this year? Yeah, no, it is quite mad to be fair. I think, like for example, I think three years ago we sold 80% of our tickets in the last seven days. I think this year, like last year, just gone. We sold 50% in the last two weeks and about 30, 40% was in the last seven days. So it is like, it does get squeaky bum time, but it just, it is what it is. Like you just, you get to a point where you've committed. So what are you gonna do like a month out, cancel the show? No, so you just gotta go with it and just hope that you've sort of, your marketing campaigns are strong enough. You're showing the audience the value as to why they should come to you. And you just gotta like, it's, you, you just got to ride the wave. Like you, it's a very sort of like team sort of thing. I don't know how to explain it. It's like you come together, you agree that you're going to do this thing, and then you commit, and then you just translate that on social media and through your campaigns, and then you just keep that momentum, keep the energy higher. But like really, you're like, it's scary. Do you know what I mean? Like you're on site, you're building, you're seven days out, and you're like, shit, we need a lot more tickets. Oh, sorry. You're like, oh, I need a lot more tickets. But you just, but everyone's there, you're all together, and you can't, you just got to keep the momentum going, you got to keep positive, keep going. And it, I feel like that translates, though, when you, when you do stay like that, and you can almost see it, I feel like customers, the audience can see it, it's exciting, you just got to keep the energy high, and then the customers know they're going to get that when they come, and then they do, and then it's all good, do you know what I mean? But yeah. Great, great, okay. And, and yeah, there's obviously, you know, you, you deal with a, an array of events. Um, what are you seeing in terms of ticket sales across those independents? Um, I presume it's similar, but also with that in mind, how can people, how can organizations, how can event operators find efficiencies and what are the efficiencies that you're seeing them find? What are, what are your recommendations in terms of areas of focus? Um, so firstly on the ticketing question across the board, uh, it's quite different for a number of our uh, clients. So. Some are wanting to keep their ticket price the same as last year and show goodwill to the customers that they're not putting prices up. Um, others have significantly increased their price. Um, so it's more the camping ones that I've seen do that from our, from our client base. They've seen the benchmark now be reset by Glastonbury, which I think has been helpful for all festivals. So ticket and prices increasing. And also like monthly payment plans. Every festival I work on is doing a monthly payment plan now, which hopefully will help them with cash flow. Um, and in terms of efficiencies, uh, one thing I would say to my clients, if there's any promoters in the room working with a production company, quick executive decision making. Make a decision early and then stick with it because then we can book you the best kit for the best price. A huge problem for us last year was people not making decisions on kit or wanting to micromanage some of our procurement decisions in things they're not really experts in. Um, and then we lost the kit, and then we had to get toilets from four different suppliers, a different servicing company. It cost double the amount of the initial cost. So, yeah, quick executive decision making will create efficiencies for everyone. And I go to you, Will, actually, on, on that question in terms of efficiencies. Um, yeah, what, what efficiencies do you find? I mean, thanks, Yaz, for, <laughs> <laughs> for pushing that one. Uh, I mean, we were, we were in a position last year as well where we were seeing a lot of kit going up in cost year on year. And promoters wanting us to continue to test the market to, to look for a cheaper deal, and we did lose kit. And uh, I'd really like to not be going through that again in, in 2023. Um, it was a question on efficiencies, sorry, Chris. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So, so obviously, it's vital that people find efficiencies. Yeah. Are there any to be found? And if so, what are the best areas of focus? Yeah, it's certainly a difficult question. We're really value driven as a production company, um, and so are our clients, and we'd like to think that, you know, within our values, we're delivering great value to our clients uh, year on year regardless, and we don't operate with a load of slack or with a load of flat, fat on top that, um, you know, is suddenly available for us to, to go and attack now. Um, I think there are, there are some simple measures that can be taken which might not just be in the planning but might be within the life cycle of the event or the, or the build of the event for that matter. Um, there's a lot of talk about um, increased need for fuel management nowadays with increased fuel costs. Uh, there are some very expensive ways of doing fuel management, which are you know, great for sustainability uh, and cost, but there are some more rudimentary ways of doing fuel management too. 
I mean, just during your build, you might find that some power companies might go and deploy a generator at a far-reaching area of a site. It might have an accreditation cabin there. It might have lighting for a campsite on a camping festival. Um, and just having someone uh, on the team, they don't even need to be super skilled, just some basic training to go around and, and monitor generators if, if, they don't already, if they're not already networked and they don't have that control kit built into them. Just someone turning off generators during the build and making sure you're not leaving uh, you know, a huge number of hectares of site running and, and lit 24-7 for the, the two weeks you're in the build, and then you're showing them the break after that. Um, it, you know, potentially there's several thousand liters of fuel there to, to be saved on. Yeah, please do. I think also it's about um, really trying to maximize your relationships with clients and, and your contractors as well. I mean, the con your you, client wants to make sure that the festival is doing well and you can guarantee a certain amount of ticket sales. And contractors want to guarantee that they're going to be able to satisfy all the festivals that are being asked. So it's about making sure that you can have really open and honest conversations with them to try and book them in so that they know what they've got throughout the year. You know, they've got overheads, they've got staff. They need to be able to satisfy those demands like we need to satisfy how many tickets we have as a, as a promoter. So I think trying to book people in earlier and then say, if you've got a tenancy of a site for however many years, I can, we can offer this rate at a reasonable rate with a, you know, this is what we're gonna set inflation at, or this is what we're gonna increase year on year. But they know that they've got that show for three years. I think that's a really good way of doing it. And it's something that even if you're working on a larger show, we, we still need to maximize that value as much as we can with contractors. And they need to know when they're gonna be able to invest in new kit or, they pay their staff an increase, or it's exactly the same from a contractor level. Okay, and obviously it's an, uh, an event, the scale of BST Hyde Park clearly employs an enormous amount of people. Um, with inflation going up, obviously people want to get paid more, we're seeing situation with strikes and everything else. You know, when it comes to, to, to um, staff, I guess, um, personnel, are you seeing a lot of pressure in that department? Are people just hiking their prices suddenly, or, or are people being a bit understood? How, how's that relationship kind of working? Well, we, um, we saw a few hikes last year before this was even coming into play because we hadn't, been, we hadn't had a live show for three years due to um, two years of the pandemic. Um, so I think we are dealing with it on a case-by-case -case basis. Like, if you're seeing that with contractors, I think it's only appropriate that you're going to listen to those conversations from a freelancer point of view as well. And I think you know which freelancers are really integral to the running of your show. They've got a lot of experience, they provide a lot of value. So I think you will deal, we're, we're viewing it on a case-by-case -case basis, so we're open to having that conversation. And I think it's the justification for it. You know, have they moved out of London now, for example, where they need to factor in travel, um, travel arrangements or accommodation or, so I think we're dealing with it on a case-by-case, -case, but I think it's a fair conversation to have with those people. Okay, well, I mean, is that your, your experience as well? Are you, have you seen, you know, major hikes from the freelancers that you use, and is it always reasonable? Uh, it, it's not always reasonable, but I think similar to Laura's point on contractors, uh, you want to form long-standing long relationships with, with individuals and freelancers as well, um, and, uh, you know, an open conversation with them about what their rates will look like this year, but also the following year, the year after that, and the year after that following inflation, and being able to work that into the budget that you're setting with your client each year um, is probably the only, the only way to achieve that, that relationship withstanding all the budget pressure that we're seeing at the moment. Um, rates, rates are really high. Um, we work on a venue in London and none of our festival clients would be able to afford the, the rates that that venue is currently having to pay just to get text to, to get the doors open. So if, if, those, if those rates start hitting festivals this summer, it will be a real challenge. So um, we need to continue to promote our industry and ensure that we're a place that people want to work in and for the right reasons as well. Um, for us to get value out of those people, it needs to be an attractive place to work and, and, and therefore the freelance will be able to offer that value. Yeah, we're going to touch on that in, a, in the next panel, actually. Um, but um, what I wanted to touch on actually was um, to, I'm asking you to start to you, Yaz. Um, in terms of when going back to ticket sales again, and obviously, um, you know, there's concern around the, the changing uh, habits in terms of purchase timing. Um, but it's kind of been mentioned to me on a few occasions that um, maybe this is just a naive way of looking at it. But, um, you know, you look at 
the recorded music industry where it will, t or any kind of, whether it's film or whatever, will, they'll, they'll target kind of super fans and they'll sell them, you know, extra value products and they'll know that they'll buy almost anything and then they'll have another product for the person that's, you know, maybe a bit more, uh, you know, that, that maybe is, it considers that purchase a little bit more, but they'll have a whole array of products aimed at different people and they'll know their market and they'll certainly upsell to the super fans. Whereas it seems a little bit, and maybe I'm being a bit naive on this, but it does seem a little bit, when you look at the early bird uh, ticket structures that you see, um, you're essentially selling you know, you're essentially giving the cheapest ticket to the to the most loyal fans. Um, is there any way of avoiding that, or is that just inevitable? Because to me, it just seems like they should be paying more rather than less. Um, I think yes, you're right. Definitely, your super fans are probably the ones that would come paying the highest ticket price. Um, but in terms of how festivals create a hype in order to reach a tipping point on their ticket sales, uh, they have to. Uh, kind of start with a low ticket price and then have a tiered staggered system so they can build hype through you know saying oh tier one is about to sell out get tier two and make people think the event is is going to sell out um, because the more people that buy a ticket and talk about the fact they bought a ticket and tell their friends to buy a ticket uh, the more tickets the event's going to sell and hopefully reach the tipping point that means they'll break even sell out uh, or make money um, so they have to start on that low ticket price and inevitably your super fans are going to be the ones that buy those. Um, I would say, you know, festival promoters are getting very creative at how they uh, upsell to their audience though. And I think, uh, you know, before we relied on ticket sales, then we had to also rely on bar sales because ticket sales weren't cutting the mustard. Now people at food is huge at festivals. So getting the right selection of food can really make you a lot of money. Upselling wellness areas, Everyone's into boutique now. If you can find a way to expand your boutique camping area and sell more of that, uh, that's, that's probably where people should be looking to add new streams of revenue to their festivals. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, it, um, obviously, you know, uh, AEG presents as the promoter, clearly, of, of BST, but what are you seeing in terms of um, interesting ways of, of, of kind of attracting, you know, higher spend at the events that you work on? I think a lot of the artists that um, are booked um, at BST particularly have a very high merchandise offering. Um, but again, I think that's the scalability of those artists. It's a fact that they're quite often artists that don't tour or um, have a reduced touring schedule. Um, so people, you know, want to... Elton John played last year, so it was that, is this, could this be the last show that Elton's going to do? You know what else can we what else can we work on? So merchandise is is quite a high one. We've got um, a Korean band called Blackpink playing BST this year, and we saw that the merchandise um, at the O2 when they played was like through the roof. So that will be a big revenue stream. But we also do look at the hospitality options. Um, I think if people's ticket choices of what they're going to spend their money on over a summer, and they and they you know they're going to limit how many things they go to. They do want that elevated experience. They want nicer toilets. They want um, access to a nicer bar. They want access to nicer food traders. So that's definitely something that we've seen across our shows um, and AEG shows. Great stuff, Stefan. Obviously, it's a slightly different scale. But what what are you looking at in terms of you know different and interesting ways to drive revenue? Yeah. So we do we do a lot through the marketing. Um, we make it really visual, sort of storytelling. We visually show people what they're going to expect when they come. So we had like a 3D map made, like animated, and walked through the festival site, and it sells value like that. Thinking of new ways to tell the story of, of the festival rather than just like a lineup. So like behind the scenes stuff, things that like sort of invite the customer into the story of your brand. But then actually on there on the day, I'd say our biggest things for us is, is just fancy drinks like you put pineapple juice in something and put a bit of pineapple in it and you can charge double and people pay it do you know what i mean <laughs> but it's true and it's like where'd you get that oh the cocktail bar and it's like people do love that sort of stuff it's like they got pineapple in the drink someone else don't it's little little things like that and it, it adds to the experience but 
we're also thinking that this year, like we've always had VIP, but we're thinking to do like tables so you, you can buy your own table and a little raised platform near the stage and little things like that. Obviously, we're in Essex, so like people lap that sort of stuff up, but you know what I mean? It's like, I think it, it, it just depends on your audience, I guess, but people do want more from their experience, though. Like you're seeing it, like the boutique festivals are growing, people do go to them because you get more, there, there's more funky, cool little things like Boomtown. There's just everywhere you look, there's something else, and, and people want that from a festival. If, you're, if people are going to less festivals, they're going to choose one that's got more going on at that festival. So I think adding those little bits of value is what people want, and then, yeah. Laura, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I think it's the customer journey. It's, it's looking at the creative. It's looking at how everything looks. You know, I think traditionally you could get away with just having a white, clear span tent that had a very rudimentary bar sign on it. And I think even a metropolitan festival now, you need to think about the look and feel and how it looks and take people through a journey so they feel like they're somewhere else. And I think it comes down to people aren't necessarily going to buy six different festival tickets or tickets. So you need to give them the best opportunity at the one that you're providing for them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, I just wanted to touch on, on um, artist fees. And I've sort of I did I mentioned this to a kind of quite well known agent about maybe artists could be a little bit more considerate about the fact that the market's in a difficult situation and maybe they could adjust their their fees um, as a result. And I was kind of like, <laughs> and the response was just laughter. So, um, so, well, I mean, do you feel that anything? You know, I guess when it comes to independent festivals. Um, if you're, I mean, if obviously you're a BST and you've got the Rolling Stones, you've got Elton John, they're, they're, they're sort of one in a million artists that are at such a high level that you can't really have much of a conversation probably in that regard. But do you see that there's any opportunity at all for uh, maybe a, a communication with artists slightly further down the, the ladder, if you like, um, to, to, to be a bit more realistic? Obviously, that would be conversations with their agents, no doubt. But is that something that you think could happen and could progress could be made if this, you know, if the if the communication, if, the, if, they were, if they understood what was happening on the other side of uh, the stage a bit more? I think maybe. I, th I, think, I think to an extent they do know what's going on the other side of the stage. I don't think, um, you know, I think they're fairly shrewd. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I'm going to enter into commenting on, on artist fees uh, explicitly. But what I would say is we really expected that in 2022, with rising costs, that artists would be touring way less uh, production and infrastructure than they used to um, and actually we just saw more and more and more and we, we costed up the production for a headliner on one show they weren't being paid the most of the headliners on that show and I'd struggle to think that they were going far beyond break even when you considered the number of crew they had the floor package that they were touring um, and all the kit required to make that work so it's it's a tricky one I think there would be a more progressive and productive conversation on talking to these artists more openly about what the house spec is um, and see if we can meet in the middle, we can still change around lighting fixtures and move trusses and so on between different nights of a show if it's a, if it's a festival with a big headliner per day. But I think we all potentially need to work together to, to have those headliners touring less kit between, between festivals because that's going to be the ultimate way to save costs, see if we can still achieve the same look. And also, there's going to be a huge emission saving there, too. Yes, I mean, is there any examples of, of pooling of equipment amongst the events that you work on? Or is there any opportunity to, to, to share equipment and uh, minimize that cost? Is this in regard to artists? So I'm going off a slight tangent, but yeah, oh. no, in, terms of, in terms of the kind of... You I know, wanted the, to talk about artist fees. <laughs> right. If you want to talk about artist fees, talk about artist fees. No, I mean, just, just with regards to artist fees, I think it's become in festivals and following on from what Laura and Stefan both said, the festival, festival experience for the audience is now much more about the actual experience, whether that's how slick the operation is as well as how creative the immersive places they're going into are. And it's, it's becoming less important what the lineups are. So I hope that that power that artists have had over fees for those style of events, obviously not talking about our Elton John style concerts, um, is that will start to show to promoters because artists have become 
what promoters are prepared to pay for them, the way that they're seen in terms of their value doesn't appear to reflect the number of tickets they can sell. So ultimately, your headliner is worth the number of tickets that they can get to your event. So if we're seeing a huge uh, reduction in people attending festivals, your headliner is no longer worth the fee they were last year because they're not bringing that many tickets to your event. So maybe they should be starting to look at a model, which I know has happened with some headliners of ours before on shows, where there's a baseline fee, and if the show sells out, then they get extra on top of that. Kind of like a touring model that, that when part, artists are a part of that. So yeah, I think that, that would be something to look at when we're all working together. Do you expect to see, I know Alak Mitchell at Boomtown was talking about the fact that, that for a while they slipped into the situation where they were investing a lot of money in key headline acts that was never really what they set about to do as a, as a, as a you know, operators of an event, and that they've scaled that back, or they've um, not necessarily scaled the spend back, but they've changed the flow of the spend so that it goes across more mid-range artists, um, and while you know, maintaining that huge focus on the experiential side of Boomtown. Do you expect more promoters to, to do that, to start spend, to spreading the cost at a slightly lower level, which I think would be healthier for yeah. the market? Yeah. I definitely think so. A lot of our uh, promoters are doing that. I think, uh, obviously, coming out of COVID, there was a lot of talk about more diverse lineups, including opening uh, these up to up-and-coming up uh, artists. And, and we've seen that reflected in lineups. And also, during COVID, one of the best things about there not being clubs and festivals, which was very depressing for me personally, was that Breakthrough Talent was able to create huge followings on social media because they weren't, it wasn't just they had to get onto a lineup, which was kind of blocked by agents who want their existing talent. So there is a new wave of artists that have a huge following that are not that expensive and are, and are up and coming. So yes, I think we will definitely see more of that. Okay, we're sort of drawing to a close and I want to give a few few minutes for questions, obviously, but um, I just wanted to end on, a, on an optimistic note. Obviously, we're in a difficult time with um, inflation soaring and we've covered everything really in terms of, you know, the um, cost of living crisis and everything else. But what kind of gives you most reason for optimism? Um, I'm going to ask this to all of you um, in the year ahead. I'll start with you, Will. Uh, I just think the tenacity has always been there in this industry, and, and I, don't see, I don't see that tapering. Um, it's difficult to find the right people now. It's difficult to find the right skilled people. But some of the golden eggs that you do find are, are amazing and will continue to drive the industry forward. Um, I think that actually these, although it can be difficult to get budgets signed off, um, and it, it's all wrapped up in all the other supply chain bottlenecks we're seeing, actually this, this longer planning and procurement cycle should long term be really good for our industry. To be planning a festival over 12 months, not six months, should make the industry a much more sustainable place to work. Um, and so I think, I think that's a bit of a silver lining going forward. Yeah, that's a very good point, absolutely. And you, Laura? I think this is what we do. I think whenever there's a challenge, we find ways to overcome it. And I think, you know, with collaboration and having these sorts of conversations with contractors, suppliers, other promoters, other festivals, I think you will find ways to overcome them. And I think, you know, one of the challenges that we aren't seeing now, um, or that is more positive was obviously the pandemic put a hold on people getting tangible experience. So from a staffing point of view, the fact that we've come back and we've had two years and we've now got graduates entering the market that are going to get that experience, we are going to start getting staffing people through again, which is a really good prospect. And I think sometimes you just need a reset. And I think that we're probably having a reset with contractors at the moment. And it's just giving us an opportunity to really build those relationships from the ground up again. Yeah, and Yaz, what gives you reason to be cheerful? Um, a, absolutely what Laura said. I don't think anyone would be sat in this room if this was an easy industry to work in. We, we love the struggle, so uh, we will keep fighting and there'll be new challenges ahead. Um, and then I think the other thing is that in times of like global depression and economic depression, people come out to party, they want to escape. So, you know, the Roaring Twenties came after World War I, uh, the warehouse rave scene popped off with the minor strikes and the kind of lowest rates of unemployment the country had seen. So, you know, people will come to our festivals and events because they need to escape what's going on in the, in the news. And that gives me hope. Great stuff. And Stefan, last word. Um... I think that, I just think as a whole, you, you just got to be optimistic anyway in this industry. I think if you didn't stay optimistic, you especially 
being a promoter anyway, you'd probably have a mental breakdown. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? You just need to just be like, yeah, let's go for it. Do you know what I mean? It's, at the end of the day, fest people go to festivals, like what you were saying, like, for a release, to have fun, to enjoy it. Do you know what I mean? I think you've got to always keep that in the back of your mind. Like, you're creating experiences for people to enjoy, so just enjoy it. Do you know what I mean? Great stuff. Okay, so an opportunity to ask questions. Anyone with any questions? I find it difficult to see at the back. <laughs> Oh, there is someone there. Brilliant. Okay. I think it's the third rope in front. Wait. Um, I've got a microphone this time. Um, I work in the more on the art side uh, of festivals, so I work um, not necessarily with um, people paying to get to festivals, but I think the thing that's missing um, in what we've been talking about is the well-being um, that everybody gets when they go to the arts or the music scene. And I think that's what we need to hold on to um, very much in we're doing a really good thing, whether it's going to a paid festival or it's coming to an arts event that I put on. So let's hold on to that. Well-being is a really, really big thing that we can push. I think that's a fantastic point. I mean, during the pandemic, obviously, there was a lot of work to bring, to bring the industry together, to unite, to, to lobby government. And it did so powerfully. It got a cut you know, in the VAT rate on tickets and various other things, but there's also the well-being side, and, you know, talking to Hugh Brasher, who runs London Marathon, you know, the, the, the you know, the, the, just standing at a concert is fantastic, that brings people up, the, the, the sense of well-being, but sport and everything else, as an industry, it has an incredible impact. I just wanted to sort of ask you that, Laura, whether you feel the industry is doing enough to make a case for that, you know, to government, when it comes to, you know, gaining support. We've made the financial argument, but there is that well-being argument as well, which is hugely important. Yeah, it's huge. And I think it, it's not just that what we're saying to government. I think it's also as employers and festivals and places of work. I think, you know, the pandemic took a strain on a lot of people's mental health. And I think the pace of our industry is unrelenting. And I think we have something um, as a responsibility as employers and festivals and free to freelancers, to contractors, to anybody that comes onto our site as a person that's got a paying ticket but also someone that's being paid to work there to think of the initiatives that you can provide to make their life as easy as possible. I think when I was talking about resetting, I, I don't think we should be trying to reset back to 2019 even of the pace that we were going to and I think that was challenging last year and the year before with the additional pressures of the pandemic but it's something from a well-being point of view that we should all be really mindful of and I think actually probably a lot of the shows we work on do a lot of well-being things from a programming point of view. I know that um, the midweek content of some of the shows we work on, well-being is at a very high priority and a high priority with no ticket price because we understand from a community point of view how important that is and that you do need to give back to the communities that you're working within. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, did you want to add to that? Just uh, going back to... Uh, what you were saying about that government level discussion, I think, uh, so Nick, who uh, is founder of the fair, he talks about a lot, like the idea of this cultural crisis and actually that's what's to follow next. Like there isn't enough funding and recognition from uh, the government for our industry. It's, it started coming after COVID, as you said, but the industry needs more funding. We've got, we're a cultural capital of the world here. There's so many amazing things that come out of the country, but one of his arguments when he's going to these calls with DCMS is in, I think, Lithuania and Estonia, they spend about 2% of GDP on culture, whereas compared to here, it's 0 0.2, 0.3%. Um, so we do need to look at balancing up um, that and the spending and using well-being as an argument for that and well-being of, of the population is, is a strong argument. Yeah, yeah that's a very good point. It's also, it's also, if we do shout about it, we need to shout about it to the public as well. Yeah. Um, because when they see these figures um, shouted about in the news, they might go, well, that should be spent on hospitals, but let's balance it out so we can understand how much it benefits the hospitals if we've got well-being in the arts. That's a very good point. Anyone else? One more question. Okay, so on the, um, in the centre there, on the left-hand side or my left-hand side? Thanks. Hi, it's uh, Ben, a festival director at Blue Dot and Kendall Collin. Uh, it's a question really about talent pool in the future. We're seeing, obviously, a shortage of talent because of the pandemic and where we've been over the last couple of years. And I've had some conversations specifically around VJs, actually, 
in the last week and how there's a massive shortage because the amount of work that's happening in the Middle East and in Saudi and the actual rates that people are actually available to do and do get in those roles and how that starkly contrasts with the, the classic festival roles that we're, and the fees we're able to offer, which in themselves have gone up year on year. So I just wondered what thoughts you have between yourselves uh, in terms of how we support new talent to come through and how we keep hold of that talent. Okay, um, I'll go for Laura for that one. <laughs> um, I think it's, we, we, a lot of organisations are looking at mentoring schemes, which I think traditionally offer people that on the ground experience um, and support. I think it can be quite daunting, especially as a freelancer going into the industry and not knowing who you can talk to or where you should be going next. So I think that's a good way of nurturing people. And I think it is just about trying to give people opportunities with a clear roles and responsibilities. So you're also not giving them too much responsibility because I think that can be quite daunting when you're not necessarily skilled up in a particular role. And I, you know, we all get that you need to do experience to become really proficient at a role, but it's about trying to find those grassroots opportunities that people can enter, enter in, into. Okay, I mean, we will be, the next panel is, is dedicated to focusing on how we uh, bring a new uh, pool of talent into the industry and address the kind of um, fallout of staff um, that happened during the pandemic. So um, we're going to end there, but thank you very much indeed, everybody. Um, it's been a really interesting discussion, and thank you guys for, for listening. Thanks.